Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Health Animated. On this podcast, we strive to make health information accessible to everyone. My name is Alex. And I'm Danielle. If you're returning to our podcast, thanks for your ongoing support. And if you're listening for the first time, welcome. We hope you stick around. So we have a really exciting topic for you today. Um, It's something that is near and dear to our hearts and something that everybody does. And we hope that we won't make you do it during this podcast. Alex, do you want to tell them what it is? Well, the topic is sleeping, but is sleeping near and dear to our hearts? (laughs) (laughs) It's definitely near and dear to my heart. I think it's probably one of my favorite pastimes. So this topic is obviously so important because we spend a third of our life sleeping. Isn't that kind of crazy when you actually think about it? And what we've come to learn is while we were doing this research, we found that the process of sleep is actually so complicated and fascinating. Yeah, it's, it is. It's complicated and fascinating. And something that I was really surprised to learn during this episode was that sleep disturbances are actually the most common complaint that doctors see in their offices. Um, and like half of Americans actually report intermittent sleep disturbances, which was staggering to me. You know, typically, if you're having difficulty sleeping, besides, you know, turning to the internet and talking to your friends and family, you know, some of us may turn to our healthcare providers, they would ask us to assess our sleep patterns and look at some of the behaviors that might contribute to, um, to poor sleep. And so you'll usually leave the office with a list of tips to help with maintaining your sleep and to help uh, practice those good sleep habits. But what's sort of lacking in the literature is measuring the impact of the various sleep factors or interventions and which ones are more important is it more important to cut out caffeine is it more important to you know not exercise a few hours before sleeping because we know that there's so many different factors that can contribute to good sleep so lucky for you today we're going to talk about a study that did just that so let's get started We really want to focus our time talking about a particular study that just came out last year and it talks about the different sleep hygiene factors and what they tried to do in this study was they looked at all these factors and they tried to measure the level of impact. It was actually conducted in Japan and the investigator's name was Akiyoshi Shimura and this article was called Which Sleep Hygiene Factors Are Important? Comprehensive Assessment of Lifestyle Habits and Job Environment on Sleep Among Office Workers. Okay, so this study took place in Tokyo between 2017 and 2019, so it was pre-COVID. So it examined responses from 5,600 workers. And who were these people? Well, about 61% were male and 38% were female. So of these people, 41.5% were married and 60% lived with family. These participants worked in a variety of different areas. Some worked in tech, finance, broadcasting, music, consulting, public office, chemical industry, not really sure what type of chemicals, um, healthcare, fashion, print, trading, restaurants, travel agencies, patent agencies, which I think would be a really cool place to work, um, and also temp agencies. And the companies ranged from anywhere between like 50 employees to 1,200 employees. So quite a pretty big span in Tokyo. Yeah, it's interesting that um, they just focused on office workers. Um, So with respect to their sleep pattern, on work days, the average time that they went to bed was around 1 a.m., and they reported, on average, six hours of sleep. And then on their days off, they went to bed at about the same time, 1 a.m., and they got a little bit longer of sleep, so their average sleep time was reported to be 7.5 hours. Now that we talked about our participants for this study, it kind of makes it seem like a game show, but anyways. <laughs> what are we going to subject them to? Well, it's actually not that bad. Basically, with this study, they had kindly just given out these surveys or questionnaires to these individuals, and they asked them a bunch of questions. And when I say a bunch, I actually mean a lot of questions. So what they did was they asked them to provide responses on this validated sleep tool called the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, which looks at a variety of uh, sleep components, so specifically seven components. 
So just to kind of give you an example of what you might expect on this questionnaire, they would ask questions about typically how long does it take you to fall asleep? How many hours of sleep do you get at night? Do you take any medications to help you with sleep? And how often do you take these medications? So those types of questions. You can actually find this questionnaire online as well. So if you're curious to see how well you sleep, um, feel free to check it out. And then in addition to the sleep questionnaire, they were also asked a bunch of questions related to the job. So they asked about stressors, their work environment, if they worked overtime, and they even asked questions about how long it took them to get to work, which we will get back to uh, later on. So I'm going to try to get through this without my dog barking in the background, but if she does bark, I apologize. So to complete the questionnaire, they had also asked questions about their sex, age, marital status, living status, and lifestyle habits. So an example of a lifestyle habit would be the time spent on using electronic devices at night. So lifestyle habits will be important uh, once we get to the results. So Danielle, with that being said, did you get a chance to do the Pittsburgh sleep questionnaire? I sure did. I did it on Sunday and um, I got six. So I'm like on the cusp. And were you surprised by that? I was actually surprised by that. I was like, uh oh. Yeah, me too. Like I, I got eight and I actually thought that overall I'm a fairly good sleeper, but eight is actually indicative of some level of sleep disturbance. So now I'm kind of reevaluating myself. I'm like, do I actually have poor sleep? You know, I was actually surprised that you scored worse than me because I always thought that I didn't have as good of sleep as you mm. because you just seem like you've got it all together with your morning person nature you know you go to the gym at five in the morning so yeah it was kind of surprising that you mentioned my morning routine because i actually think that the reason why i had a higher score was because on the nights where i had to wake up to go to the gym the next day i actually have more difficulty falling asleep and the reason is because i feel like i'm actively thinking about the need to fall asleep because every single minute i lose would actually make it worse because I need to wake up early the next day. So I was trying really hard to like convince myself to fall asleep sooner. And, you know, ironically, that actually kept me awake because my brain became more alert. Okay, so let's get into those sleep hygiene tips and let's see what is the best. So how they looked at this in the study is they looked at the habits that were most associated with poorer sleep. So in this case... Um, we're going to be looking at results in the form of odds ratios. So I'm just going to get a little bit sciencey on you guys. So odds ratios are the odds of an event. So in this case, it's the odds of poor sleep in the exposed group versus the odds of poor sleep in the non-exposed group. So for example, um, let's say some of the people in the sleep study were like Alex and they went to the gym at 5 a.m. So we would look at the odds of the event, which is poor sleep in the 5 a.m. group versus the odds of the event and the people that don't go to the gym at 5 a.m., so people like me. So what are the odds of poor sleep? The odds of the poor sleepers waking up at 5 a.m. divided by the odds of the people that are not waking up to go to the gym at 5 a.m. So this gives us what's called an odds ratio. So just to throw it out there, let's say the odds of waking up and going to the gym at 5 a.m. is 20. So that means that this hypothetical group of people that wake up at 5 a.m. have 20 times the odds of having poor sleep than the people that don't wake up at 5 a.m. to go to the gym. Like I said, that's all hypothetical, but we're going to look at this odds ratio concept with respect to other sleep parameters that they actually looked at in the study. Wow, I would have never in a million years thought to associate odds ratio with going to the gym, but somehow you just did it and you're able to explain it as well. So hats off to you. We are going to start off with the biggest bang for your buck, just in case you, you know, have to go do something exciting. So we're going to start off with what habit had the worst impact on sleep. That would be the nightcap. So this study looked at those who had nightcaps before bed versus those who did not. And in the case of this study, they were referring to nightcaps as an alcoholic drink before bed. So we wanted to clarify that in case some of you used Wikipedia to look up the word nightcap, because apparently it can also mean a warm glass of milk which is not what they were looking at in the study. So Alex actually looked into where the word nightcap actually originated from. Alex, why don't you tell us where its origins are from? 
the word nightcap has a little bit of a history behind it. So for those of you who don't know, a nightcap is something you wear on your head before you go to sleep because it helps to keep you warm at night. Do you wear a nightcap, Alex? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I was just gonna say, I feel like this was a very like historical Victorian era type of thing where people wore nightcaps. Maybe when heat wasn't re- readily available. But um, nowadays, I, I, I'm gonna guess that most people don't wear nightcaps. But anyways, in addition to wearing a nightcap, sometimes people would also pair that with an alcoholic drink because they believe that having a warm alcoholic drink at night actually helps induce sleep and to help them get a better night's rest. So over time, the word nightcap was kind of given to um, an alcoholic drink just before bedtime. So that's a bit of like the historical context behind a nightcap. That's actually a really good segue, Alex, because a lot of people do still carry with them this notion that alcohol is a sleep aid and it can help them to become sleepy and it can help them with their sleep. However, in this study, they found that nightcaps had an odds ratio of 2.4 to 3.5. So those people that had nightcaps were more likely to have poorer sleep than those that didn't have those nightcaps. So why is this? If we look at um, our sleep cycles, there our sleep cycles can be divided into two different stages. You can have your REM sleep and your non-REM sleep. So the non-REM sleep is kind of this like slow wave sleep. Um, it's various different stages. Um, and then your REM sleep is this kind of very um, active stage of sleep where your brain is firing quite rapidly. Your eyes are moving quite rapidly. Um, but you're not moving quite rapidly because your body is making sure that you don't. Um, but anyway, so REM sleep is thought to be the place where you do a lot of like memory consolidation and it's a very, it's considered very restorative. So in terms of, um, the effects that alcohol can have on our sleep, it can actually have variable effects. So at low doses, alcohol may increase or decrease our REM cycle and our slow wave sleep. However, as we go to higher doses of alcohol, it's been known to decrease REM sleep and also decrease this slow wave sleep. So in terms of like sleep um, continuity and sleep time, so how long you're actually sleeping for, low doses may or may not have an impact on how long we're sleeping for. However, higher doses can actually decrease the amount of time that you're sleeping for because in the second half of your sleep, it actually increases the sympathetic nervous system. And for those of you who um, are trying to remember the sympathetic nervous system, it's your nervous system that is associated with the fight or flight response. So um, it just makes you feel more stimulated. So people tend to actually sleep poorly in the second half of their sleep. And one other thing that alcohol can actually impact is the time it takes to fall asleep. So at low doses, alcohol can actually increase the time it takes to fall asleep because it actually can have a stimulating effect at lower levels. So within that first hour of your first drink, it can actually um, be more stimulating, which is why people tend to feel that kind of, you know, more chattiness, the little bit of that euphoric feeling. So, but at higher doses, it can actually decrease the time to first fall asleep, although you will still have an overall poor quality of sleep for the reasons mentioned. This is really, really fascinating. And you're presenting this dichotomy of like low dose versus high dose. Because when I think about nightcap and the listeners out there, you guys can correct me, but I think a nightcap is just like a small drink to accompany you uh, when you go to bed. So I'm wondering, because of the right amount, you're actually tapping into those low dose effects which as you mentioned could be variable so it could either have some dare i say like positive benefits or it might have a a negative impact on your sleep so i just thought that was really cool that you pointed it out in that kind of context yeah it is it's very interesting i think there's probably still more studies that are needed on the those low dose effects yeah, like what ex- what exactly is low and what actually what exactly is high, right? <laughs> and also just individuals, right? Everybody is different. In the study, they actually found that those people that rarely or just infrequently had nightcaps were still impacted. So another thing that I found really interesting, um, this is not from this study, but just from additional research looking into this, um, 
happy hour drinks can also impact sleep, even though it's been hours and it's already been cleared from your system. So there is some suggestion that alcohol can actually have um, a longer lasting effect on sleep that kind of lingers even past when it's been cleared from the system. That means Friday night drinks are not a good idea. Is that what you're saying? (laughs) Well, if you want to have a really good night's sleep, it might not be the best idea. That's so sad. But if you want to have a social time with your friends and drink responsibly, it might be a a good idea when this whole pandemic's over. (laughs) Perhaps the happy hour drinks might not be applicable right now. Yes, definitely not applicable right now. Although, you know, still possible virtually. (laughs) Very good point. (laughs) It was interesting too, in this um, article, they looked at um, alcohol use in people with insomnia, and they actually found that 15 to 28% of people with insomnia actually used alcohol to help them sleep, which is not really advised. Um, So for the reasons that we kind of discussed earlier, right? The last thing that I kind of wanted to point out about alcohol is that if somebody is already sleep deprived, they and they have a drink it they'll actually experience a greater sedating effect from alcohol and these individuals can have slower reaction time and actually experience daytime drowsiness the next day and people that are sleep deprived even an ounce of alcohol can actually make that sleep deprived person more accident prone and you know people who are sleep deprived kind of already have slow reaction times similar to people that already have a blood alcohol content of 0.1 grams per deciliter right so if you're sleepy you're already feeling a little bit intoxicated so adding alcohol into the mix is not a good idea it's like a double whammy and so i find it so fascinating that uh, those with insomnia will often turn to alcohol to help them sleep uh, when in fact it might you know make things worse for for people but what I would be curious to learn more about is is this kind of like the chicken and egg type of uh type of question where you know is it the alcohol that's causing people to to not be able to fall asleep or is it the insomnia that's causing people to drink alcohol yeah it's a it's a good question and I think it really depends so I think you know, that's why, you know, going to see your healthcare provider is so important because they'll go through kind of this assessment and figure out, okay, what's going on in your life? What are your factors? And they'll go through these sleep hygiene tips, which are actually really important and, you know, a huge part of the treatment for sleep disturbances. So one key takeaway point is to try to avoid alcohol for at least four to six hours before your bedtime. So with that being said, let's turn to our first runner-up. Okay, so in second place for poor sleep was a regular meal times. So before we get into this factor, I just wanted to give you a quick background on the circadian rhythm. Essentially, the circadian rhythm is your body's natural clock. So this um, study found that irregular meal times negatively impacted our sleep. And the theory or reasoning behind this is that mealtimes actually tie into our regular circadian clock. A lot of animal studies have actually found that regular mealtimes are associated with enhancing this clock's activity. So what was interesting in this study as well is that they found that people that ate dinner one to two hours before bed had better sleep. So I think this is actually a pretty controversial um, finding because you know, late night dinner eating um, in other studies has actually been shown to increase like um, high blood sugar levels at bedtime and which can actually delay sleep. And however, the authors of this study that when they found that this was one of their findings, they actually cited another study that was also done in Japan that looked specifically at having dinner, like late night dinner, two hours before bed and they found that there was not an increase in blood glucose levels um, in the non-diabetic population. So that was interesting. Um, But, you know, personally, I think common sense would say don't eat too close before bed because, you know, if you are going to eat a big meal or just a meal and then you're going to lay down right away, it it can increase your risk of like, you know, esophageal reflux disease, um, and also you're not really moving around, so you don't really have anywhere to, to burn those calories. 
It's probably not recommended. However, it was an interesting finding, but I think this one would need a little bit more research behind it before we can say, yeah, eating within one to two hours will help you fall asleep. But what the main takeaway is irregular meal times will actually negatively impact sleep. So stick to a regular schedule when you have your meals. Yeah, that's actually a, a really good point that you brought up. You know, try to avoid eating too, too close to bedtime because especially if it's a heavy meal because it might lead to, you know, acid reflux, heartburn, which by the way, I experienced on the weekend and it was not fun. I wasted a whole day just suffering. Um, and so now I'm cutting coffee for an entire month, but it's all good. It's all good. Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, no, I like this was super fascinating because when I was reading this, I also had the same thought. I'm like one or two hours before before bed seems really close to bedtime. But I thought about it a little bit more and it could be explained by like a cultural difference where, you know, it maybe can be traced back to the fact that uh, perhaps these workers tend to work later at night. So then naturally their meal time would shift closer to bedtime. So perhaps in Japanese culture, that's normal for them. Um, but I totally agree. I think the takeaway isn't so much to be like, hey, eat one hour before you go to bed because that would improve your sleep. But it's more so to stick with a regular uh, meal time. Mm-hmm. And that's a good a good point too about uh, the work, um, work-life balance and work-life meal time. All right. Coming in at number three is waking up before dawn. And this one had an odds ratio of 2.18. So before we sort of explain the significance of waking up before dawn, um, I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about our circadian rhythm because we can't talk about sleep without talking about circadian rhythm. They go hand in hand. So a large part of our circadian rhythm is driven by the light dark input. It just means like our circadian rhythm is heavily influenced by the amount of light that enters through our eyes. And we'll get into that a little bit more in just a little bit. So essentially, you can look at our sleep-wake cycle as being uh, heavily influenced and dictated by our circadian rhythm. Um, Side note, it's also affected by our homeostasis, uh, but we'll save that conversation for another time. And what's kind of cool about our about the circadian rhythm is you can think of it as like our body's internal clock, except this clock um, is a little bit different from regular clocks where it would actually reset itself Uh, upon the first exposure to a light source. So typically, you know, when you first wake up in the morning and that sunshine shines through your windows and through your curtains, that's when it'll tell your circadian rhythm to reset itself. So on average, most humans have a circadian rhythm of actually not 24 hours, but 24.15 hours. So it's just a little bit longer than your traditional 24 hour clock, which at first seems a little bit odd because it doesn't align exactly with the 24 hour clock. But if you think about my earlier definition, it's the idea of your clock just resetting itself whenever it's exposed to that first uh, light of the day. So that's why our circadian rhythm doesn't go like out of whack or opposite to the 24 hour clock. Sounds a little bit like magic if you don't know the science, let me tell you. I'll be honest, the way we're explaining this stuff is I think a lot of people would argue that it's very surface level. We could spend hours and hours just looking through the details of this. Like, you know, you talked about, you looked into like um, clock genes Mm -hmm. and a lot of it is, can be explained at a molecular level. So, I mean, we're definitely not going to go there, but what we will do is talk about sort of which part of our brain is sort of responsible for the circadian rhythm. So when our eyes receive light input, they direct this input to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which then links up to a gland called the pineal gland, which then will actually stop the production of melatonin. So you guys probably have heard of melatonin as the hormone that kind of causes you to become sleepy or drowsy, and that's exactly what it is. So melatonin is usually what is secreted in the dark when your eyes do not have that light stimulus. So we're really sensitive to this light resetting effect that Alex alluded to earlier. And the wavelength of light that we're most sensitive to happens to be between 460 to 500 nanometers, which is, drum roll please, blue light. Okay, so back to the fact that waking up before dawn 
actually has an odds ratio of 2.18 for sleep, I think now it's kind of intuitive, right? So if you wake up before dawn, it's really, really dark outside and there's not any natural light. So if you wake up before dawn, it's really important to kind of use that blue light trick to your advantage if you want to kind of jumpstart your day and wake up a little bit more easily. So, you know, turning on the lights while you're getting ready is a great start. There's also different blue light lamps that you can get, you know, for that morning period, obviously not for bedtime. This is actually a really important point for right now because we are located in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, And so we're actually not getting much light, especially in the morning. And so I hear a lot of people purchasing um, these like lamps to just help them with their morning and kind of wake up. So the next factor, which is also related to circadian rhythm, coming at number four is lack of sunlight in the morning in the bedroom. So how they defined um, lack of sunlight is, uh, for example, if it does, if the sunlight does not come in directly into the bedroom, if it's sort of shaded, so if you have some curtains or blinds, or as um, we mentioned earlier, if you wake up before dawn. With the lack of sunlight, the odds ratio is about 1.48 to 1.6. So now that we've spent so much time explaining circadian rhythm in the last factor, this all kind of ties in nicely because now we can understand that light conditions in the morning and night are very important factors, meaning that having light exposure in the morning helps to reset the circadian rhythm. And on the other hand, light exposure at night delays the circadian rhythm. So, Alex, this is really interesting because I think you mentioned um, like blackout curtains, like being a contributing factor to blocking out the natural light. So I was wondering, have you ever come across like shades, like roller shades that are electronic that can, you know, be on at night because you want it to be pitch black and then be up in the morning when you need it to be? There are actually smart blinds where you could use your phone to time when the blinds open and close. So this would be super cool. Now we basically don't have to move. We just, you know, have smart lights, smart blinds, smart everything. Like we, by now we should all have excellent sleep. But um, but no, all jokes aside, like I think like seemingly small things could actually make um, a big difference in your quality of sleep. Yeah, I wonder what the price point on those seemingly small (laughs) motorized uh, electronic blinds would be. I will be searching that after this episode. So that factor was quick and easy. So the other factor, again, also related to circadian rhythm, and to my surprise, wasn't as high as I thought it would be, and that is screen time during bedtime. And that came at an odds ratio of 1.5. Yeah, so... In this 24-hour world, humans can really make light whenever we want to. We, you know, we've had fire for ages, and now we have iPhones. So these iPhones actually complicate things a little bit. So as we mentioned, blue light, not so good for us at nighttime. And unfortunately, blue light from digital screens is actually a big deal, and it can really affect our circadian rhythm. So don't you have a really interesting study that you want to take us through? I do. So we came across this article in the Harvard Business Review, and um, it was about blue light glasses because after we started talking about this tip, I was like, oh my gosh, blue light and those blue light glasses. I wonder if it has any impact on sleep. So this CEO thought the same thing. So he actually bought all of his employees a pair of either blue light glasses or normal glasses and they found that the people that wore the blue light filtering glasses actually slept more so they found that the managers slept five percent longer and the people working in customer service slept six percent longer they found that the managers had a higher quality of sleep they found that Both the managers and the customer and service employees had a higher quality of sleep. So the manager is having 14% better sleep and the um, customer service representatives having 11% better sleep. And they also found that um, people perceived that their performance was higher if they were in the blue light filtering group, 
which is, you know, very interesting. Um, they also found that it had kind of a beneficial effect on like four different work outcomes and that would be like higher work engagement. So it was about 8% for both the managers and the customer service employees. They found that there was more helping behavior. So this was pretty high. So it was like 17% in both the managers and the customer service representatives. And also that there were fewer negative work behaviors, and that was in the number of about 11.7%. So I thought those were pretty, um, pretty interesting results for such a, you know, kind of simple intervention. Although, I mean, if you don't normally wear glasses, it's probably, um, you know, would take some time getting used to, especially for someone like you, Alex, who actually had laser done. Yeah, I mean, I have so many questions about the study. I, I mean, know. <laughs> I have two questions. First is, how cool were these glasses? Because <laughs> if these glasses are not cool, I ain't wearing them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, my glasses are cool. Okay, yours are different. <laughs> um, the other, I, I just imagine them being these like huge oversized goggles that fit over your glasses. <laughs> because what if, what if the workers wear glasses normally, right? Maybe, then, oh, maybe it was biased. Maybe they excluded those people. And then the second question that I, I'm curious about is, were these positions like uh, like public-facing positions? Like if you're a customer service, service representative, like are you on the retail floor and like, you know, seeing customers and things like that? Things like that? Because if I was a customer, I would take notice if all the employees <laughs> were wearing the same glasses and they're all like walking around doing their job. I wouldn't. I'd be like, what is, this is interesting, like, what is this place doing here where everybody's wearing the exact same pair of glasses? Part of the uniform, Alex, part of the uniform. Yeah, anyways, well. It's a good point. There's, there's, there's still some good takeaways, I think. (laughs) Yeah. Um, can you tell everyone that tip that you taught me about the phone, the iPhone? Sorry for Android users. Thanks for spilling the tip already. (laughs) I was just gonna say it. Actually, this is new information for me, uh, which is that if you're an iPhone user, there's actually a nighttime filter on your device. So, I mean, let me just preface it by saying that I don't have any, I don't own any shares in Apple, although I wish I did. But anyways, if if you have an iPhone, there's a feature called Night Shift. And all you need to do to access that function is just to go through your settings and your display and brightness to kind of activate it. What was interesting is that I actually had the feature already activated without me knowing it Um, but it was really cool for me just to take a look to adjust the time so that it fit my nighttime routine just a bit better so I think I uh, had it to turn on an hour earlier than what it was set for so um, if you're an Android user I I think there's a app that's similar and it's called Twilight so if you're an Android user and you and you use that app, let us know. Um, or if there's other features on Android that you want to share, um, yeah, we'd be we'd be curious to know as well. Mm-hmm. And please don't judge us for both being Apple users. <laughs> <laughs> yes, don't judge us. I like to use Apple devices because I think it's a little bit more user friendly. So I'm not that good with all the extra features. Just give me the basic stuff and I'm good to go. Basic pharmacists uh we're cutting that out um (laughs) should we talk about stimulus control i think so we should so using electronics in bed is probably not the best idea as we just discussed and really we want to try to eliminate those types of maladaptive or bad behaviors because ultimately we want to have we want to be able to achieve the goal of associating the bedroom with just sleep And this type of approach is actually, there's there's actually a name for this type of of approach and it's called stimulus control therapy. So with stimulus control therapy, um, there are some kind of neat little strategies or tricks you could kind of do on your brain to kind of create that um, association. So number one is you should really only go to bed when you feel tired. So that's kind of like a no brainer. The other point is to really try to use your bedroom only for sleep and sex only. Um, So I see a lot of uh, people having like... um, TVs. 
Yes. So I notice a lot of people like to have like a TV in their bedroom, and that's actually、um, something that you might want to think about changing up if you do experience disturbances in in your sleep or if you don't have good sleep, because as we mentioned, TV screens associate blue light, so it's not good for your for your sleep. So try to keep your TV in the living room if possible. So the other factor is to try to get up、uh, same time every day. Regardless of your total sleep duration, so I think this kind of goes back to the idea of like resetting your circadian rhythm,、um, making sure that your internal clock is sort of as consistent as possible. So the the last strategy I want to share is if you're kind of like me sometimes where you go to bed and you're like tossing and turning. Well, if you actually find yourself doing that for about fifteen to twenty minutes. It might it might actually be better to just get out of bed, go to another room, and do something else. For example,、uh, read a book. You want to avoid watching TV or using a computer screen because, as we discuss, the light that's emitted from these devices may actually have an arousing effect. And then once you're kind of feeling a little bit tired, feeling a little bit sleepy again, that's when you go back to bed. So. That helps to kind of create that、um, positive association where it links your bed to feelings of sleepiness. Yeah, that's a good point, Alex. Because I feel like, for you know, when you can't sleep, it can just be a little bit frustrating, and you're like, "Oh, why can't I fall asleep?" And you just keep thinking about it, and then you just look at the clock, and you're just watching it, and then it just makes you more stressed. And I think, yeah, it's good to just kind of get yourself out of that scenario and go to another room, like you suggested. Mm-hmm. For sure, for sure. So the next point, coming at number six, is weight gain, and that has an odds ratio of one point two to one point four two. So wait, hang on a second. Why is weight associated with insomnia? Well, hear me out. So with this study, they asked people about their weight when they were eighteen years old, and then they asked about their current weight. So they found that the bigger the weight difference. The higher the odds of having sleep issue. At first, I thought it was kind of weird because,、um, you know, why is weight associated with insomnia? But then, when we think about it a little bit more and we looked into their sort of、um, thoughts around it, they it actually does make sense because weight gain is known to be a risk factor for breathing disorders such as obstructive sleep apnea. So what they're trying to say is that、um, the weight gain might actually be、um, contributing to、um, medical conditions that affect your sleep. So after weight gain, coming in at number seven would be not eating your vegetables, which has an odds ratio of one point three five. What? Okay, okay. When I first read this, I was like, "What the heck?" So, <laughs> hear me out. There's actually been some recent nutritional psychiatric research that has looked at the link between meals and our mood, and what's really interesting is that、um, they found that depression and anxiety were associated with the amount of vegetables you ate. So, i.e.,、um, if you eat more of them, that could actually help with some of those symptoms. The other factor that they looked at is with certain types of vegetables like spinach, asparagus, romaine lettuce. Um, they contain、uh, what's called folic acid, and they it's been shown that if、uh, people have a deficiency in folic acid, that is also linked to depression. So why am I telling you guys all about this? So what we know is that when someone is feeling depressed or has anxiety, that may actually be linked to having difficulty sleeping. So that's how they can see that vegetables may have a link to、um, uh, difficulty sleeping. So the other angle that they looked at was through an endocrinology、uh, lens. So they found that eating vegetables may actually help with regulating high blood sugar, which is also known as hyperglycemia, and that actually has been associated with sleep. Which is why、um, you may have heard of people saying to avoid eating sugary foods about four to six hours before bedtime. Now, the last angle that they looked at was more from a socioeconomic status, which is really interesting because I feel like a lot of science journals don't really look at that kind of stuff. But they actually found that vegetables may be an indicator of economic status. So 
Unfortunately, um, it's been shown that having a low income has been associated with sleep issues. And of course, we all know that vegetables are generally not as cheap as your staple foods or like your fast foods, especially if you shop organic or if you get your vegetables through the farmer's market. Yeah, that's a, that one was really interesting. I think I thought the exact same thing when I first read this. I was like, vegetables? What? What's going on here? I think it's also important to keep that in mind that, um, you know, just because there's one factor that is showing something that's kind of signaling an issue, it's not necessarily the one that's having, um, you know, a cause, which is why correlation does not equal causation. So I think it's it kind of is a good reminder um, for us and for and for you guys. So the last factor that we wanted to talk to you guys about is caffeine. So this came in with an odds ratio of 1.27. So you might be a little bit surprised why this wasn't higher. And the reason behind that is because they actually looked at caffeine use at night. You know, not in the morning, but only caffeine use at night. So most of us just don't use caffeine at night for good measure, right? So these are those rebels who are going out there and having their nighttime uh, coffee. So before we dive into why caffeine can impact sleep, I want to go back to the other biological mechanism of sleep. So we already touched on the circadian rhythm. The other biological mechanism of sleep is something called homeostasis. So homeostasis can be described as the need to go back to a set point. You can kind of think about homeostasis like a thermostat. So if you set your thermostat at, let's say, 22 degrees uh, Celsius, then your thermostat is going to reach 22 degrees Celsius if it's cold, and then it's just going to kind of linger there, and it's going to be at its set point. And if it gets too hot, it's going to cool it back down to 22 degrees. So that's kind of what your body is doing. So your body is trying to maintain homeostasis. And that's kind of where um, this molecule called adenosine comes in. So as our day kind of progresses, your body releases more and more adenosine into the system. So as this molecule adenosine builds up, it actually makes you sleepy. So caffeine then comes into play into this natural sleep mechanism because caffeine actually blocks up the adenosine receptors. So it prevents it from binding and it prevents it from making you sleepy. So it kind of impacts your body's natural homeostasis around sleep by blocking those receptors. On average, caffeine has a half-life of about five hours. So what that means is it takes five hours for your coffee level in your body to go from 100% down to 50%. And then it takes another five hours for it to go from 50% to 25%. And it takes another five hours to go down from 25% to 12.5% and so on and so forth. So every five hours, your coffee level is decreasing by half. So For example, if you have a morning cup of coffee like me at 8 a.m., then by 1 p.m., half of it's worn off. By 6 p.m., there's only a quarter left. And by 11 p.m., which for me is around bedtime, there's only about 12% left. So that kind of provides the rationale as to why, you know, having that afternoon or evening coffee is not really a good idea because at that time, it's going to take you five hours before your levels go down to 50%. And at 50%, you know, you're still feeling pretty good from a caffeine perspective. So in terms of that uh, five-hour half-life, um, it's actually not the full story. Some people will actually metabolize caffeine quicker and some people will metabolize it slower. So it can actually range between, you know, an hour and a half all the way up to nine and a half hours. So if you're one of those people that um, clears coffee slower, then you're going to experience the effects of caffeine for a longer period of time. So you're going to be one of those people that's actually more sensitive to it. So our suggestion would be to avoid caffeine at least four to six hours before bedtime. 
and to try to minimize your daily intake and you know if you notice that you can have that afternoon cup of coffee and it doesn't impact your sleep then that's totally fine but um, you know if you are having that afternoon or evening cup of coffee on a regular basis and you're starting to notice that your sleep is being impacted look look towards the coffee as one of your culprits and try cutting it out so the one thing that I was really surprised about is uh, with caffeine, with the way the study was designed, they specifically looked at people um, who drank caffeine close to bedtime. And so I would actually imagine that the odds ratio would be even higher because, you know, they're not just drinking caffeine in the morning, but it's actually at night. Um, you raise a really interesting point where you talked about uh, how quickly people might metabolize caffeine. And I'm just wondering if maybe like the group that drinks caffeine, that would be the group that are like the high metabolizers. So that way their sleep is not as impacted um, as much as we would think. Yeah, it could be because maybe if they were impacted, they'd be like, well, I shouldn't do that again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no. And this is just me throwing it out there is I wonder if the circadian drive is stronger than the um the effects of caffeine yeah for sure and you know with the homeostasis around the adenosine i mean if your levels of adenosine are just building up to high levels it's still going to be there and it will compete with the caffeine to get to that receptor right so at some point the adenosine is probably just going to win if it's really late and your body is feeling that urge to go to sleep so yeah it is it's true at some point your sleepiness will just kind of take over yeah it's the battle between adenosine and caffeine <laughs> to be continued on another episode i i hope yeah so a couple of other interesting findings that didn't quite make it to our i guess our top eight list uh number one is commute time so they found that the odds ratio for having a commute time of at least an hour each way um is 1.5 which is kind of interesting because now that we are in a pandemic, um, many of us are working from home. So this factor is probably either is not an issue at all for people or people's commute time may have even decreased because there's like less traffic on the road. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, that's a good point. I'm still one of those people that commutes and yeah, definitely there's a lot less people that are going into the downtown core. So another interesting finding was actually that the people that were married um, had better sleep than the people that were single. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So the odds ratio was 0 0.756. Yeah, that kind of surprised me, but maybe not, maybe not too surprising. So what, what I'm curious to find out is, was there a difference between like married status versus engaged versus living together with your partner? Because for me, it kind of all just comes down to, are you sharing a bed with someone? I just, it's just kind of interesting to kind of think about those nuances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have to see how all those people uh, who've gotten engaged and who are going to be married after the pandemic feel about their sleep. But I guess on the flip side, if you're single, you don't have to deal with your partner snoring. So yeah, totally. It's it's an interesting um, it's an interesting one. I am a little bit surprised. <laughs> Let's talk about the um, limitations of this study because with all studies, there's always going to be some sort of limitation. So first one is pretty obvious. So obviously, since we're based in North America. Um, we have to think about the geographic location and the type of people that's being studied, right? So this study was conducted in Tokyo with office workers. The other thing that we talked about uh, a couple times already is that the cause-effect relationship associations are unclear. Uh, because if you think about how the study was designed, it was essentially the researchers just handed out a bunch of questionnaires for people to fill out. So we really do need a randomized trial to examine whether sleep is improved by these sleep hygiene interventions that have been identified uh, by this study. And I think another thing that, another limit of to the study is that you just can't trust us humans. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you just, you, you, can't, you can't trust humans. So, I mean, participant self-reported data might not be accurate, right? I mean, we all like to see ourselves in the best light 
and you know if we're on a study we want to try to please the study designer so i think it's um which is also another type of bias yeah absolutely um and like how are they supposed to remember what they weighed at the age of 18 like i don't know do you remember what you weighed at the age of 18 uh i have no idea in fact if you ask me what i ate last night i probably won't be able to tell you unless i think really hard so it beats (laughs) me how how people were able to report their weight when they were 18 years old yeah and um so all that being said though although there are limitations i think it is something that is something that's important to remember is that all of these sleep hygiene tips that we're providing are still evidence-based recommendations and they are still um, have a good scientific rationale behind them. The thing that may or may not be accurate based on the study is really the order of like your, the bang for your buck. So, you know, is alcohol going to be the worse, worse for your sleep than having caffeine? The study suggests that possibly so. However, you know, it's not a randomized control trial, and so we can't really definitively say that, yes, having alcohol before bed is the worst thing that you could do for your sleep. However, that being said, Alex, you brought up a really good point earlier when we were kind of having discussions about the data that are we ever really going to have a randomized control trial <laughs> that looks all, at all of these sleep hygiene measures? Probably not. There's just no way to emulate a natural sleeping environment and to be able to study just one specific intervention, right? You can't force everyone to go to bed at the same time and force everyone to wake up at the same time and like control like when they drink caffeine and when they have alcohol because at the end of the day, if you're changing all these variables, you're essentially disrupting their natural sleep pattern and that in itself could be a, uh, a a huge limitation major source of confounding yeah. and yeah an error to to how you interpret these results so unless we create ai robots that replicate human behavior i think we might have to wait a little bit longer for these uh, randomized control trials to come out You know what? In the meantime, I think this is real world data that we can look to to help guide us in our decision making. And I think, you know, for me, it gives me some, you know, some strong takeaways of things to kind of look out for. And some, you know, some might be pretty obvious, but I had no idea what the rationale behind them were. Like the blue light glasses thing really blew my mind. And even just the light resetting effect of, um, of blue light also kind of was very impressive to me. Certainly one takeaway for me is just being a lot more mindful about my exposure to light and, um, checking all my devices to make sure I have that night filter on and so that I'm able to kind of increase my chances of sleeping better at night. So, um... I think that's a wrap for this episode. Is there anything else you wanted to throw in before we say bye to our listeners? Uh, No, I just hope that we kept you guys awake and we didn't put you to sleep during this episode. (laughs) I mean, on one hand, we achieved our goal of helping people sleep. But then on the (laughs) other hand, it says something about our content. But anyways, (laughs) fingers crossed that you're still here listening to us. So if you enjoyed this topic, guess what? As a spoiler, next week, we're actually going to continue this conversation and have a chat about some of the medications, in particular focusing on over-the-counter drugs that might be useful for sleep. Because, um, if you didn't know, in 2020, did you know that American consumers spent over $800 million on melatonin supplements? And that represents a 42% year-over-year increase. Wow. So we would be remiss as pharmacists if we didn't at least talk about some of the drugs used to treat insomnia. So that's what we're going to do next week. Wow. That's a lot of money. That's almost a billion. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. So stay tuned for that episode. And thank you guys so much for tuning into this week's episode of Health Animated. If you like what you heard, it'd be really cool if you can you know, let us know, send us a little DM, maybe comment on our Instagram post. And definitely we would appreciate it if you can share this with uh, people around you. 
And please connect with us on our various social media platforms. You can find us by just typing in at Health Animated. Thank you guys so much again for tuning in. And bye bye for for now. now.